So it was, um, you know, a lot of accomplishments. But just to cut it short, I'll just mention that he finished his PhD in 2003 in political science from Northwestern University. And he has a number of publications in national and international journals of review, repute, besides writing a number of books and book chapters with um, accomplished publishers. And uh, he has also reviewed many policy briefs and reports has uh, been a special issue editor for certain journals. And Professor Scott also um, got several research fundings, both intramural and extramural. And he has also made a number of professional presentations and speaking at various universities ever since year 2000. And today, he will be talking about the multi-level governance of health in the European Union. So I would request all those who are listening to this um, today's session to please put your questions if you have any question in the chat box and we can take up that at the end of the session. So um, I would invite now Professor Scott, it's over to you. You may share your uh, presentation and you may begin now. And can I confirm that you're looking at the full screen and not like the chat yes, box? Yes, of course. No, uh, we, are, we are looking at the full screen, yes. Because the apology is, as I say, I don't usually work on Google Meet, so all the finicky little things. But you're doing it good, very good. Okay. <laughs> no, no hassles <laughs> at all. Yeah, <laughs> please. You have contributed to my education already. Okay, so I'm going to, I have the pleasure of talking about the European Union, and what I'm going to try and do for you is frame it in terms of something that it's often understood to be, which is a regional economic order, which is why I put up the African Union COVAX image to begin with. Because what we're thinking about here is essentially what happens when a group of smaller units come together, smaller governments, smaller states, for some kind of a common purpose. Um, normally when I'm talking to Americans or Europeans, I point out that the European Union is basically made up of small countries. I have a friend in government in a county, one of 33 counties of California, who has a larger budget than the government of Lithuania. I live in the state of Michigan, which has approximately the same population as Sweden. I don't remember the exact Indian states, but I believe there's four Indian states which collectively have the population of the entire European Union. So when you're thinking about the European Union, on one hand, you can think of it as an established big political unit, but you also need to keep in mind that a lot of its fundamental rationale is that European countries are not that big. Nobody in the world is going to talk to Lithuania on its own, but they're definitely going to talk to Lithuania as part of Europe, as part of the voice of Europe. So keep that in mind as we speak. In today, what I'm going to do if I can figure out how to advance my slides now, even PowerPoint is letting me down. Today, I'm going to start with regional organizations and move into the somewhat unexpected and very interesting European Union approach to health policy on which Dr. Stefan is an expert, actually. But let's start with international organizations in general. So the first thing is not all health effects come from health policies. This is really important, right? So for example, take a, something that doesn't look like a health policy which is the North American Free Trade Agreement. That opened up the import of basically American sugar from the United States to Mexico. The result was a very well-documented increase in the amount of sugar Mexicans ate and every kind of problem you get when you eat a lot more sugar, ranging from tooth decay to obesity. Over and over again, you see this. You pass an international property law, and it turns out that it benefits certain kinds of pharmaceutical manufacturers at the expense of people who want pharmaceuticals. You pass a trade law and rich countries promptly export all of their polluting activities to poorer countries that will do them. So when you're thinking about how to evaluate international organizations, any of them, including the European Union, but also part of the United Nations, a regional organization, you want to focus on both their direct and their indirect effects. And a lot of the time, what matters is the indirect effect. So the direct effect is where you say, we have a health policy and we're going to try and do a thing. We are going to purchase vaccines together in order to get a better price and a better place in the queue for vaccine acquisition. We are going to pass a law regulating the handling of organ transplants. Those are direct effects. And when you go to an organization and you click on health policy, that's often what you find. A lot of especially medical professionals stop there. They live in the world of health. 
it doesn't occur to them to click on consumer protection or international trade or development assistance as a health policy. But those are areas where you can often find larger effects. As I'll say later, arguably the European Union's biggest health effects have been through its environmental protection law and its labor law, not anything that you call a health policy. So you always look to the indirect effects. You look to the equivalent of the NAFTA case where liberalizing trade in food led to a change in Mexican diets. You look at the pharmaceuticals cases where intellectual property law changes the economy of India, changes the economy and vaccine availability around the world, changes how the branded companies in the West behave. Now this matters because your direct goals can have negative indirect goals, right? So NAFTA definitely produced economic growth in Mexico. Access to the American market led to a lot of new employment in Mexico. It also produced worse health, worse health for a lot of Mexicans. Or equity producing, right? So for example, the pharmaceutical industry will tell you that if you open up patents on, for example, COVID-19 vaccines or other essential medicines, you get equity we address the problem that Africa doesn't have anywhere near enough vaccinations, but the pharmaceutical companies would say that you're cutting off growth. You're cutting off the incentive to innovate in medicines. And of course, environmental sustainability. There's a lot of ways, as I'm sure you know, to have economic growth that is explicitly at the price of the environment. So you have to pay attention to direct effects where we say it's a health policy and the indirect effects where we're making a health policy, whether we admit it or not. And you also need to be aware that there's a tremendous amount of garbage that is talked. So for example, when I'm discussing pharmaceuticals, everything about pharmaceutical innovation, pharmaceutical companies, pharmaceutical trade, is just a wash in people who are paid to create confusion. And that's an explicit strategy by a lot of the actors, especially companies, is to create confusion and create argument so that people give up and try to stop having a stance. But here's the thing. If big multinational companies that are very concerned about their profit margins work hard to influence the debate, that tells you you're onto something. That tells you that something important is happening that's worth people spending money to influence it. So it means that research matters. Okay. So the summary of this slide is when you're evaluating the impact of anything on health, you've got to focus on the direct effects, the health policy, and the indirect effects. And in particular, be aware of the indirect effects of things that sound good. So you say, yeah, this is great. It's a policy that produces environmental sustainability. Oh, it hurts growth. This is a policy much more common that is supposed to promote growth at the price of equity or the environment. Um, I've now figured out how to get the chat up. So as um, Dr. Sood said, just stick questions, especially quick ones in the comments. Now let's frame the European Union. There's a lot of what we call regional international organizations, right? There's UN agencies, many more than most people know, that are theoretically global. Anybody in the world can join them. But there's also regional ones, and the European Union is a case of this. Now, I'm afraid that my little graphic got clipped off, but what this shows schematically is that there's two kinds of variation between regional international organizations. Some of them is effectiveness. When they try to do something, how well did they do it? So, for example, in the upper left-hand corner, you see the North American Free Trade Agreement. It doesn't do much. It creates free trade. It protects private property rights. It does not protect union organizing. It does not protect the environment. It certainly does not protect the rights of migrants. But the few things it does protect, which are mostly to do with trade across borders, it does very well. So it's high on effectiveness and low on breadth. It doesn't do much. Down at the bottom, you have UNICER, which you've probably never heard of. It's about four countries left in South America. The idea was a kind of left-wing social policy organization. It never set out to do much and it didn't do anything effectively bottom left-hand corner. And then you get more interesting ones like ASEAN, which discusses a lot of issues. And to my absolute amazement, it actually gets some stuff done. And when you look at Southeast Asia in 2023, you wouldn't expect any Southeast Asian regional organization to get much done. You know, what exactly do Laos and Singapore agree about? 
And off in the top right corner, you have the European Union. Among international, regional international organizations, the EU does by far the most things and with by far the most effectiveness. So a lot of our question is how did it come about that the EU did this and how does this shape health and health policy? Well, let's think about how to understand the direct and indirect effects. And here's the three faces. Now, the first face is what I talked about, the explicit public health and health policies. And I gave a little list of things where you see, in, in particular, the European Union. So communicable disease control, pandemic preparedness. Um, so that's things like building up surveillance systems in order to identify new infectious disease risks, biosurveillance, vaccinations, non-communicable disease prevention policies. So that's things like trying to reduce the incidence of, I don't know, eating disorders or unhealthy food. The first face is what you get if you go to a website and you click health and you find out what the health ministers got together and agreed to do. And as I keep saying, a lot of the time, it's not the most important thing that's happening. The second face is frequently the most important thing. It's health and health policy consequences of market policies. So to take the European Union, workplace regulation, that's health and safety, right? Do you have to wear protective equipment in a dangerous job? Do you get a strong ventilation system if you're doing something that produces dust in your workshop? Do you have train control systems fitted so that you don't have train crashes? Do you have regulations on the number of hours that doctors can work before they have to take a mandatory break? These are all things that affect health and they can improve health. The doctors get more sleep and do better work. They can also affect health systems. If your health system depends on people working 48 hours straight and you take away that, then you're gonna get a reduction in apparent efficiency even if you get happier doctors and better quality health care. Environmental regulation. Can you pollute? Big deal. Procurement policy. This is a thing that makes governments very excited and trade law very excited. What can you buy? Can you, for example, there's currently a big fight between the United States and the European Union because the United States just passed a very, very big climate change package. If our planet continues to be habitable, it will partly be because of that legislation under President Biden. And it's very strongly about making sure that Americans are invested in addressing climate change by, the, by something everybody understands, which is making sure that they get jobs, building solar panels and building renewable energy. Well, that's great, except the Chinese and the Europeans think that they have industries for building renewable energy. And they don't see why they've been locked out of producing electric cars or solar panels for the U.S. market. I won't say who's right or wrong or how, whether it matters, but it's an example of how procurement, namely the buy American provisions that you have to buy an American built electric car, are influencing what happens to Japanese, Chinese and European economies. Medicines and devices regulation. What kinds of medicines can you put on the market? Everything that is sleazy and corrupt about medicines and weird and puzzling about medicines is even more so with medical devices which range from disposable swabs up to incredibly high-tech machinery, and where the companies range from very big ones like Johnson & Johnson down to a couple of guys in a shed producing a particular part. Professional regulation. What is a doctor? If I have an Indian undergraduate medical degree, what countries can I go practice medicine in, and what do I have to do to get myself authorized to practice medicine? Very complicated. Research. Most of the time, governments fund research because they think it has economic benefits. That's certainly the case in Europe. Sometimes they think it's because it has defense benefits. That's certainly the case in the United States and China. But it can affect what we think about with regard to health extensively. For example, do you research environmental problems? Food safety. And of course, the one we're all talking about is supply chain integrity. Namely, are there policies to try and produce a resilient supply chain so we don't, for example, end up with weird global shortages of essential medicines? The third phase, finally, is fiscal governance. Most regional organizations don't do that, but it matters a lot in two kinds of cases. One is the European Union. Uh, the other is 
the global environment where it's the IMF at work. And the IMF is what you would expect from anything living in our world today, which is that it picks on smaller countries because great powers, India, China, Europe, United States, even if they didn't control it, you would the IMF would tread warily and you know telling them what to do. If you're a smaller country, the IMF tells you what to do. Fiscal governance is about making sure that governments don't break certain fiscal rules. And usually that's their own business, right? If the government of Switzerland wants to break its own fiscal rule, that's Swiss politics. They can do what they want. If the government of Brazil wants to rewrite its fiscal rules, that's Brazilian politics. They can do what they want. But if you're a European Union member state, your fiscal politics are subject to European surveillance because the EU says we can't have a shared currency, the euro, unless we make sure that governments are all behaving themselves. And the IMF tries to do that globally. There's also conditional lending. Uh, have a look over at Sri Lanka if you want to find out what fun that can be, where Sri Lanka ran up, government ran up a lot of debt to China, and now the Sri Lankans are obviously trapped in a debtor relationship with China, which isn't much fun. And the Chinese are newly trying to figure out something that the Western countries have failed to figure out for 70 some years, which is what exactly do you do when you actually find yourself with a massively indebted country and no obvious way out of it? You have a lot of power over Sri Lanka, but doing anything with it is very, very hard from Beijing's point of view, just like it was very, very hard from the perspective of London or New York or Geneva. So your takeaway here is there's three faces, explicit health policies. Go to the website, click on the tab, learn what they're doing. You will often be very disappointed. You won't find much. The second phase is the consequences, the indirect effects on health, health outcomes, and health policies of market making and regulatory policies. Do you have safe medical devices? Do you have strong research-based pharmaceutical industry? Do you have tired doctors? And the third phase is less common, but it really matters politically and to policy when you see it, which is fiscal surveillance of the basic government budget. And that's a big loss of sovereignty, whether it's semi-voluntary, as with the European Union, or it's involuntary, as with Sri Lanka, or Kenya has just entered a structural adjustment program with the IMF, or what have you. So in that context of how to think about regional international organizations, let's go to the EU. Remember, it was in the top right corner of my little graph. It is more integrated, more broad in terms of the range of things it does, and more supranational, meaning there's more autonomy and authority for the EU government than any other regional international organization. There's a real debate, which I've joined at times, about whether you can compare the EU to a regional international organization at all. Does it belong in the same basket as ASEAN or the Gulf Cooperation Council, or do you call it a federation? What this means is there's no reason to think that any other organization is on some trajectory towards becoming the European Union. You don't look at the African Union and see a future EU. You don't look at Mercosur in South America and call it a future European Union. You certainly don't look at the Shanghai Cooperation Council, which is the institutional vehicle that is collapsing because of the invasion of Ukraine, as a future European Union, okay? You don't score a regional organization by whether the African Union or ASEAN is becoming more and more of an EU. Instead, you look for lessons. You don't evaluate yourself against the EU. You look for lessons from the European experience. Now, I said that there's a debate about whether to view the EU as a regional organization. I love to talk about this, but here's just two points for self-indulgence, right? The first is federations redistribute money internally, period. I don't care if we're talking about India or Austria, Brazil or Switzerland, South Africa or the United States. Federations redistribute from poorer, sorry, from richer to poorer areas. The European Union basically doesn't. It creates a legal framework and then says, go survive in the market. 
This is a problem because it means that the European integrated market creates all sorts of losers and there's no machine to pay them off. Right? In the United States, we make policies and it completely destroys the economy of the state of West Virginia. And then automatic stabilizers kick in and we give people in West Virginia money so that they can live decently or get out of West Virginia. And at a minimum, the state of West Virginia will have good enough roads that they can attract a business or use the roads to leave for a better economy. The European Union doesn't do that. With one asterisk, it might be starting. I'll talk about that later. And that is why there's a big fault line across Europe from basically between the Northwest and W and the Southeast of Europe. A long arc of countries, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Poland, um, to a lesser extent, the Baltic states, they basically, they're all getting richer at the same pace as the rich countries, but they're not converging, right? You're not seeing convergence in per capita income between the rich and the poor European countries. The rich ones are getting richer at exactly the same pace as the poorer ones, which means that the European Union, which already has an enormous variation in the economic power and wealth of different member states, it's not converging. The market is not producing convergence. It's producing a poor southeast, southern and eastern fringe and a rich northern and western center. And there's not a lot of appetite in the north and the west to share their money with the south and the east. In other words, if you look at the European Union through the lens of what is a viable fiscal system, there's some really big questions about it. And that's why it got into so much trouble from 2008 onward with fiscal governance and fiscal crises across its member states. Anyway, the EU was founded in 19, starting in 1956. Whoops, that wasn't quite what I intended to do. But it's now extraordinarily broad and complex despite the fact that it began as basically an arrangement for managing coal and steel in six countries. Why? Well, here's a few things. First of all, it's a continent of rich but small countries, right? Remember what I went back to, this five Indian states that have a total population equal to the European Union. There's countries which you might regard as significant countries, Sweden, which have the same population of one of 50 of American states. And I'll bet most of you don't think about Michigan very much at all, or North Carolina. Now, this really matters. Ask Estonians and Ukrainians. Ask the Estonians. They haven't been invaded. Why haven't they been invaded? Because they're members of NATO, which means you have American soldiers on your territory protecting you, and they're members of the European Union, which means you've got 26 other countries allied to maintain your territorial integrity and wealth. Ask the Ukrainians. You can argue that part of the reason Ukrainian morale held up and is allowing them to do the damage that they're doing to the Russian invaders is precisely that early in the war, the Ukrainians were offered candidacy as a potential European Union member state. In other words, there's a lot of self-interest. Estonia and Ukraine both have big, long, flat borders with Russia. And Estonia joined the European club and is much more secure and prosperous as a result. Ukraine didn't, and that's why 10% of its territory is currently occupied by a genocidal invading army. Second thing about the EU, and this is really distinctive, and this is not something I think you should expect from other regional international organizations anywhere else in the world, is it is a law state. The EU is built on law. Member state legal systems implement European law, okay? So what this means is let's pass a law in Brussels or let's have a court case that decides something important in Luxembourg where the Court of Justice of the European Community Union is. This is part of domestic law for every member state. So if I'm a citizen in Cyprus or Malta or Sweden or Finland or Poland or France or Belgium, I can now file a lawsuit under European law. So there's EU law saying you have to, you don't pollute your beaches. Well, if I find a polluted beach, I can file a lawsuit in any domestic French or Spanish or Portuguese court. And that court will implement European Union law. And if I think my rights are being violated, my European rights are being violated, member state courts have to accept that case and support European law. This is why any 
attack on the power and integrity and unity of EU law is so important, right? So I don't know if you're paying attention to it, but there's a couple of authoritarian countries in the European Union. Uh, Poland and Hungary are not democracies, period. There's some real questions about Bulgaria and Romania. But Poland and Hungary clearly are not democratic regimes, and they want to break up European law. And if they do that, they will actually be striking at the heart of the European Union. Because the reason the EU is more important than uh, the OECD or PAHO or the African Union or whatever is that the European Union's law extends to every corner of the European Union's territory and every aspect of its society. Now, this is great. If what you want to do is sell Austrian wine or German cars or Spanish holidays or Finnish... Okay. Right, because there's 440 million people who can now buy your wine or eat your olives or drive your cars or visit your beaches. That's great, right? Europeans yeah, don't... Yeah, yeah. Hi, are you... Uh, 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 on. So, yeah. Okay, I think I fixed that. And equally, Let's say you're trying to optimize supply chains, right? A lot of German cars come from Slovakia, right? So the Germans build high, high level stuff. And, uh, oh, Stefano's got a great question. I've nearly even got it, got to it yet. Um, and equally, as I'll jump to, if you have labor mobility, you need harmonized qualifications. Is this doctor a real doctor, right? Somebody shows up with a medical degree from another country you know, in Bulgarian, how do I know whether this person is a real doctor or just somebody with a laser printer? How do I know, even if they're a Bulgarian doctor, whether they're qualified to do the kind of medicine that I'm hiring for in Germany? Likewise, integrated agricultural markets. It's a long time now, but in the 1990s, the Europeans had the shocking discovery that they had enormously integrated agricultural markets, which was allowing a very weird and gross disease called variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, mad cow disease, to pass through the agricultural supply chain. And nobody knew how many diseased cows and sheep were being sold and eaten in European markets and potentially killing people. Result, once they discovered this in the course of a big scandal, they realized that they had to tag cows. And now a European cow has to have a little tag in its ear with a microchip installed more or less at birth and everywhere that cow goes, all the way until it becomes a sausage, it has to be monitored all the way through to make sure that, for example, if it turns out to have been exposed to disease, that they can grab it before it goes into the food chain. In other words, integration begets integration. If you go on a skiing holiday in Austria and you break your leg, you're going to reasonably ask for somebody to help you with the health insurance costs of your holiday. If your system starts opening up to hiring doctors from other countries, you're going to reasonably ask for harmonization of professional qualifications. If you're going to import cows from the United Kingdom, which was a European Union member state at the time, you're going to want to know whether they've been exposed to disease. So integration creates more integration. That's a really important point for understanding the EU. Now, EU governance. Woof. Key thing is it's really complicated, okay? Anything with 440 million people is likely to be complicated. But the EU has a special thing, which is it's not designed to primarily to do stuff. It's designed by member states to allow them to only do things they want to do, right? It's the tool of governments, of countries, of member states to engage in collective joint action, such as having a big market, or sharing their development aid policies. So it's designed to make sure member states are not asked to do things they really don't want to do. And that means that it's really complicated and the treaties go on and on and on, the treaties that constitute the EU, and the legislative process is astonishingly complicated and so forth. So getting things done requires creativity, right? It requires for example, it's very hard to make legislation saying you're promoting health because they deliberately wrote the treaty article about health to limit what you could do. So if you want to, for example, increase the food safety system, 
you have to ground it in agricultural policy and internal market policy, even if what you mean to say is health. So getting things done requires creative workarounds, and there's a lot of them. But each time you do some creative workaround, a creative adaptation, you create a new layer of complexity. So once you've done it, for example, once you've introduced fiscal governance through a side treaty, now you have a side treaty with one basis for fiscal governance and the European Union's constitutional treaties with a different basis for fiscal governance. Now there's two treaties. This is great if you're a lawyer. Everything adds a new layer of complexity to what was already a very complex system. So that's point one. It's really complex. It's really complex because it's designed to allow a lot of influence for governments. But the workarounds add to complexity. Key point number two is it implements nothing. The EU has about 26,000 employees. Half of them are translators. Member states do almost everything. Okay? So you make a European Union law on food safety. It's member state agencies that have to implement the food safety. You make a European Union law on using your EU health insurance access when you're in a different country. It's the health systems and the health ministries that have to implement it. I could go on. You make a law about not discharging sewage onto beaches. It's environmental protection agencies that need to monitor sewage and find people who dump sewage on the beach. Even when the EU does something, right, and you talk about, for example, the European Medicines Agency or the European Food Safety Authority, what they're actually doing is making recommendations to national governments to implement or to the commission to implement, to recommend to member state governments. In other words, a lot of what the EU does that looks like a binding decision by an agency actually is a recommendation to member state agencies to actually do it. They do it, but the implementation capacity at the European level is trivial. Which leads to the third point. Don't forget the courts. A lot of the development of the European Union is driven by people expanding and using European law and rights as Europeans through member state courts with the support of the EU Court of Justice. So a lot of European integration, including in health, has happened because of the courts, not because governments and legislators got together to do stuff. So here's a couple of presidents. Uh, anyone know who they are? Thought so. On the left, you see Ursula von der Leyen, who is the commission president. And on the right, you see Charles Michel, who is the one of the two council presidents, because there's two kinds of presidents for the European Council. There's actually a web page on the EU website, which basically says we have three different presidents. Here's where we're going to explain what the three presidents are. I think this is kind of emblematic of the way the European Union is governed, because you don't find a website on, you know, the web homepage of the French government saying, what does our president do? So here is a very brief guide to the entire European Union. And on the left, you see the like 100,000 word book where we try to explain this stuff and its health impact in more detail. The upshot of it is I'm going to very briefly mention this stuff, but it is complex. You don't need to know it unless you deal with the EU. I want you to know the complexity is there so that when the EU does something, you're aware of what's going on and what does it actually mean to say the EU does something. But I don't expect you to know all of this stuff, right? So absorb the mood. And if you actually need to know this stuff, well, we published a good reference book for you. Okay. The European Council. Don't confuse it with the Council of Europe. That's a different organization. Welcome to Europe. It's the heads of government. They don't have much of a legal role. For most of their history, it was informal. But there's a fundamental truth of political power. When 27 heads of government get together and agree something, it happens. So they get together and they issue a communique. And that communique basically told everybody what to do. And the other institutions would come along and make it law. So huge political power. It's a nice demonstration of how if you have huge political power, you don't need that much of a legal role. You can drive the agenda. Legally, the European Commission drives the agenda, right? It's the executive. It's in charge of implementing things, implementing meaning getting member states to do it, 
It also almost monopolizes legislative initiative, meaning unlike essentially every other political regime in the world, you can't be a member of the European Parliament and introduce legislation. You can't be a member state and introduce legislation. A legislative proposal outside some very narrow and specific circumstances has to come from the commission. It has to come from the executive. So the commission is the European Union you see all day, every day. The council is heads of government. The commission is those 26,000 people, half of them translators, so those 13,000 people who make policy and monitor implementation and propose legislation. They're formed into ministries which are called directorates general, right? So DG Santé is health and food safety, DG INPA for institutional partnerships. I don't know why they call it that. It's development and really aid and relief. Then you have the council. I put those two because they're the two that just got together to issue a European global health strategy. There's the Council of Ministers, which is not the Council of Europe or the European Council. It is sectoral ministers, right? They call them formations. So there's a thing called EPSCO, which is an acronym from the French for employment, social policy. That's where health and social policy, so labor and health ministers get together and make decisions. So if you put forth a proposal for legislation, the European Council and the Commission might drive it, but it's the Council of Ministers, the health ministers who meet and say, we'll pass this health policy. You make a transportation policy, it's the Transportation Council that decides it. If you make an agricultural policy, it's the agriculture ministers who get together and decide it. Notice, by the way, that this means if you coordinate, it's member states that coordinate, right? So there's no mechanism at the European Union level to make sure that the French agriculture minister and the French trade minister are agreeing with each other. If the French don't coordinate, that's not Europe's problem. And you see a lot of countries, Germany is one signally, where the German health minister will come make one policy decision and the German agriculture minister will come make a totally different decision because Germany doesn't put much effort into coordinating domestically. Then the European Parliament. It is directly elected. It is not an organization Europeans are excited about. It's very easy to predict European Parliament elections. Look at who's in power in member state governments and then look at the opposition and the opposition will win the European Parliament election. So if the Social Democrats are in power in Germany, you expect the Christian Democrats to do well in the European Parliament elections. If the Socialists are in power in Spain, you expect the Populares, the right, to win the next election. If the Christian Democrats are in power in Austria, you expect the Social Democrats to do well. We call this a second order election in political science, but basically what it means is that the only people who are motivated to vote for European elections are people who are mad at their home government. They're not voting on European political performance. This is one of many reasons that you should expect nothing from the European Parliament and therefore be very impressed, right? The EP is actually a cool organization, it has a lot of policy expertise, it has a lot of influence, and it does a very good job of sticking up for citizens' interests in what would otherwise be a very narrow club of governments and appointed commission executives. So the European Parliament is actually very good at carving out a space within legislation and European politics for broad citizen interests. So the voters obstinately refuse to accept that the European Parliament matters and just view it as a way to register discontent with their member state government. But the European Parliament actually matters. The Court of Justice of the European Union is the final arbiter of EU law. EU law is supreme over member state law, okay? The French courts cannot override an EU Court of Justice decision. The Polish courts cannot. That's what the fight between Poland and Hungary and the EU is about right now. So it's at the center of the law state of the European Union that it's one of the final appeals courts in many ways like a constitutional court for all the member states. Then there's the European Central Bank, which is extremely autonomous, even by the standards of central banks. It's really a long way away from political accountability. This is because economists live in some sort of an upside down la la world in which you're more predictable when you're less accountable. Right? Think about that. It doesn't make any sense. But it is the basis of the European Central Bank. So the European Central Bank from 2008 onward refused to help member states that were in crisis because it wasn't accountable to anybody. 
and then it reversed gear and it massively staged essentially a takeover of five member states in crisis, which also wasn't part of its treaty mandate, but it's not accountable. So never underestimate the impact that the European Central Bank can have on the broad politics and economy of the European Union, and never overestimate the extent to which it listens to anybody with a democratic mandate. There's lots more. European Investment Bank, agencies, Food Safety Authority, Medicines Agency, Communicable Disease Control. If you want more, read the book. But what I want you to take from this slide is that when you say the European Union did something, you should always ask a question about what exactly happened. Did the council make a statement or did they pass a law? Did the Court of Justice pass a ruling or did the Council of Ministers simply issue a statement? What does this amount to in health? First phase, it's pretty simple. Health was growing as an EU policy rationale. More and more legislation said we care about health. But until COVID-19, there was like basically two laws. One was about the handling of organs and blood, and the other was about handling of people who go get health care in another country and want to be reimbursed for it. The second phase mattered a lot more, right? Pharmaceuticals, devices, patient mobility, that's where you go to another country and want health care. State aids, can you subsidize your public hospitals or ambulance services? Competition law, if, I, if I'm Dutch and I want to open up a pharmacy that sells to Germany, do I have European legal support to do that? Professional qualifications, is a Lithuanian doctor fit to tra practice in Germany? Are Germans discriminating against Lithuanian doctors? And then furthermore, big indirect effects like environmental protection, which has been very good for Europeans health, consumer protection. If your product that you sell me injures me or makes me sick, I can sue. And labor law, your uh, workplace has to be healthy. Those have big effects. All of these have been historically derivative of the European Union's main mission of building a big regulated internal market. The third phase is fiscal governance matters a lot in the EU doesn't necessarily work, but it matters a lot. It's a very big claim that member states have to pass budgets that the European institutions collectively, meaning both the commission and the other member states approve. But it doesn't work all that well for reasons that kind of make sense if you've ever seen a government. So to summarize, integration begets integration among democracies. If you are going to buy food produced in a different country, you want a regulatory framework that ensures that food is good. If you're going to go on a skiing holiday in Austria and break your leg, you want to be sure that your German health insurance is good. If you're going to employ a doctor from another country, you want to be sure that doctor is actually a doctor. If you're going to fill a prescription from another country, you want to be sure that prescription is a real prescription and not a fake. The mechanisms that lead to integration tend to happen among democracies. Authoritarian regimes are much less likely to care about that kind of thing. Second point, remember I said the EU institutions are good at blocking legislation? If a majority of member states really want something, they get it. They get together in the council and they say it. If a member state really dislikes something, it tends to get delayed implementation. So that's kind of the underlying compromise. The majority of the EU gets its way and that especially includes the big countries, Germany and France. And if you really just hate it, the odds are pretty good that you don't oppose it. You just focus on getting delayed implementation. And the third point is that what underlies the whole European Union is the supremacy of European Union law over the member states. Now, in an organization with less supranationalism, less shared history and less sense of a shared fate, Right? Look at the way Europe came together when you, Russia invaded Ukraine. You get more autonomous member states and less collective achievement, right? So, for example, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, likes to talk about Asian values of respect for sovereignty. That's bullshit. Respect for sovereignty is actually a concept invented by Europeans about five centuries ago. Nobody in the world really respects other countries' sovereignty. They respect power. So it's not about Asian values. Tell me about the Asian values that unite Indonesia and Laos, that unite Thailand and the Philippines. What it is, is that ASEAN is made up of a bunch of governments that are jealous of their sovereignty and don't particularly want to work together. But every so often they have a shared common goal 
and then they use ASEAN to pursue it. The European Union just does that because it's so integrated and has so many common interests on a much grander level than ASEAN ever will. So I will, for my last section, talk about COVID-19. And you noticed as I spoke about the EU that I occasionally would say this changed with COVID. Because COVID, a lot of the most important impact of the pandemic, a lot of, sorry, let me put this differently. The most dramatic effect of the COVID-19 pandemic in most of the world, or the most surprising thing, has been precisely the limited impact it had on the politics of most countries. If you wanted to predict elections in 2022, you could have just taken the polls that you saw in 2019 and projected them forward, right? Donald Trump's polling didn't change even after he got a couple of million Americans killed. Jair Bolsonaro's polling didn't change after he got a few million Brazilians killed. The German Christian Democrats didn't regain the position despite handling things quite well. The British Tories failed to blow themselves up despite Boris Johnson. Country after country, India's one, you didn't see much impact. This world-changing, life-changing event and the political systems just march onward. The EU is one of the few exceptions. Things did change there. So this is a cartoon we commissioned in 2019. Article 168 is the first face, the direct European Union health policies. And if you read it, and I'm being kind, I'm not making you read European law at 8.30 at night. What you find is a whole list of phrases that say there's no European right to act. The European Union will only support member states. And there's a lot of authority to support member states. What we're, the point we're making with our cartoon is that this is a gate with no fence. They built a gate. See, there's the gate. You can open and close the gate. It is sturdy. It is well-oiled. It has a good latch. You unlatch it. You go through. You latch it closed again. They forgot the fence. So all these sheep are different policy areas in which the European Union is making policies that affect health, trade law, intellectual property internal market law, agricultural policy, fiscal governance. All these policies are being made that affect health and they just go around the gate. So the only thing you don't get in Europe in 2019 is explicit health policies. What you do get is a million policies that affect health that aren't health policies. Well, that's the cartoon for 2019 when we did our book and we do our book every five years. And so we thought we were done until 2024. Within about six months, we were working on uh, an emergency third edition with a new cartoon in which the member states decided, yes, they did want a lot of health policy. They had a huge European Council meeting in June 2020. Notice how quickly that happened. And they decided they wanted lots of EU health policy, vaccinations, expenditure for member states, expenditure for health preparedness, all sorts of stuff. How did that happen? Well, in spring 2020, a lot of the world media likes to say the European Union is going to fall apart. It's reliably boring. The, well, no matter what happens, the New York Times says the European Union is screwing up and the British newspapers say the European Union is falling apart and a lot of Global South newspapers say the European Union never had a chance anyway. And in spring 2020, it did look bad. A lot of national egotism. There's a little new program called Rescue for shared civil protection resources. They didn't activate it. Member states focused on supplies for themselves. Uh, you know, Italy wasn't about to share any masks with Germany because Italy was having a huge medical crisis. Germany wasn't about to share masks with anybody because they figured they'd be having a huge medical crisis in a couple of weeks. Now, a lot of the time, the egregious stories were misunderstandings. So, for example, the Czechs halted a shipment of masks from China to Italy. And this was initially reported as the Czechs stole the Italian masks. Here the Italians are, have their hospitals overflowing and there's death everywhere. And the Czechs have stolen the Italian masks. That's how the media reported it. What it turned out is they were fake masks. They entered the European Union in Czechia. The Czechs inspected it and said, this is counterfeit. So the masks got burned, right? They weren't suitable for anybody's use. But that follow-up, nobody knows it. What everybody remembers is the headlines they read saying that Czechia had stolen Italy's masks. 
Furthermore, notice that territorial egotism is a big problem within member states. So within Italy, which was the first country to get hit really hard, Lombardy has a basically screwed up neoliberal health system and Veneto has a much better, more primary care focused health system. So Veneto was in less of a crisis and that meant that when Lombardy said, help Veneto, give us equipment, Veneto said the hell no. You handled COVID badly. We are not giving you our precious and limited resources. We're going to focus on our own people. Same thing within Spain. All governments became very selfish and egotistical when they thought that their citizens were going to be dying like flies. So far, so grim. How did the EU get the coronavirus so wrong? says noticeably the New York Times. I wrote that. Well, guess what? European Union member states come together. And this is the kind of story that you don't hear in most of the rest of the world. First of all, they learned something, which is that healthcare supply chains meant egotism was self-defeating. The biggest producer of PPE, like masks, in the world is China. The second biggest producer was Italy. Cutting off Italy wasn't such a great idea if you needed masks, right? And furthermore, there's a lot of cross-national supply chains. So do you really want to allocate healthcare resources based on where somebody located a factory? You know, do you want the British to have control over all the vaccine production because they produce the um, key ingredients? Or do you want the Spanish to control vaccine production because they tend to have the factories where they put them in little bottles, the vials? And that's not just in healthcare. The example for, that I use to explain how the European economy works is Belgium. There's two facts about Belgian, the Belgian economy. First of all, it's almost impossible to buy a product in Europe that doesn't, hasn't touched Belgium. You can't buy a car without car parts made in Belgium. You can't buy a television that doesn't have passed through a warehouse in Belgium. Belgium's economy touches everybody. But good luck finding anything made in Belgium. You'll find some Trappist beers. That's about it. So on one hand, nobody in Europe can cut off Belgium because Belgium is integral to producing anything. But equally, Belgium can't cut itself off because Belgium doesn't ultimately produce and finish any goods. So what that means is if you close national borders, the whole European economy seizes up. You can't get any PPE masks. You equally can't get any televisions to watch now that you're stuck at home for the pandemic. Other things, tourism. There's a bunch of member states where tourism is their main business. France, Italy, these are tourist superpowers. And they're relatively diversified countries. Cyprus has basically had two industries. One was a beach and one was the Russian mafia. The Russian mafia has been substantially closed down. Cyprus needs you to come have a beach holiday. Cyprus really needs you to come have a beach holiday. Equally, Germans want beach holidays. As a point of personal self-protection, you do not ever want to get between Germans and a beach. Very dangerous place to be. If you see Germans heading for a beach, take shelter. They're going to get to that beach, even if they have to walk over you. So Europeans wanted mobility. Europeans wanted their summer holidays. They, they do. Then there's workforce mobility, right? Agriculture. There's huge floating groups of agriculture laborers who move around harvesting crops. You close the borders, these guys are all stuck in Spain harvesting fruit when what they're urgently needed to do is go up to Germany and harvest potatoes. And short, member states could no more self-isolate than could their people, right? You can't sit in your apartment and starve to death. And likewise, it turns out you can't close Belgian borders because everything in Europe passes through Belgium. So the member states act, and do they ever. They've been getting rid of their health program. Instead, they renamed it. They called it EU for Health, and they gave it a 19-time budget increase. Vaccine strategy. This is really big. They decided to purchase vaccines together. So the EU institutions negotiated the prices and the purchase quantities. So you don't have little Lithuania and little Latvia and little Malta with half a million people trying to get the attention of Pfizer or Moderna. Instead, you have a big, rich, 440 million person European Union with plenty of pharmaceutical industries within its own borders trying to negotiate. That gets people's, that gets the attention of companies in a much bigger way. 
We got a pharmaceutical strategy because the Europeans discovered that, among other things, they were dependent on India and to a lesser extent Britain. And they didn't like that. They didn't like having their fate depend on a small company in Liverpool. And they definitely didn't like their fate depending on India's public health priorities. They wanted their fate to depend on their own decisions. The vaccine strategy is here to remedy that. Implications for the Indian industry, I'd love to hear your thoughts. They gave a lot more money and resources to the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which had a good pandemic. They worked to speed up the EMA, European Medicines Agency's authorization for new medicines. And they created the HERA Health Preparedness Emergency Response Authority. There's a lot of conflict and confusion about what exactly HERA does. The idea, the dream, was that it would be a really advanced biomedical research unit. It's increasingly a purchasing unit for vaccines, but they're still fighting about what exactly it'll do. And they put a gigantic amount of money into what they call civil protection, which is basically stockpiling. So stockpiling things you need for emergencies, health emergencies, stockpiling PPE, you know, personal protective equipment, masks, ventilators, and also um, stockpiling other things. They stockpile firefighting equipment so that if a member state has a big wildfire, they can have relevant equipment. Now, the headline I put on this is a big enough quantity becomes a quality of its own, right? Quality is a type, quantity is a number. But when something gets 20 times bigger, it has changed its nature. It's gone from being marginal to important. It's gone from being ignorable to something you have to pay attention to. So even if a lot of what they did was put more money into existing frameworks, that nonetheless means that they, even if they put a lot of money into existing programs or lightly renewed programs, putting 20 times more money into something changes what it is. Big enough quantity has its own quality. The other faces for once don't dominate my talk. So they second face, they, uh, the commission acted quickly against export bans. They established green lane permit schemes, which basically meant that you could get your car parts from Belgium and you could have your agricultural workers move between Spain and Germany on schedule. There's a vaccines pass on your phone, a little QR code which allowed you to say, I've been vaccinated, which was useful at airports. Americans, amazingly, have little pieces of cardboard with no IT system backing them up, so nobody believes I've been vaccinated. They redefined public health to say Europe, public health is a European, not a member state problem. They tried to coordinate their travel rules, and they also had a whole lot of big regulations on things like medical devices and state aids that were coming into effect and they backed off because they really didn't need to create disruption in the medical devices industry in the summer of 2020. Well, with regard to the third phase, this might matter even more than the other things, but we don't know. They immediately dropped all the fiscal surveillance and budget obsession. Like there was no way that any government in the world had a, except maybe Mexico, adhered to normal budgeting rules in 2020. And Mexico, a lot of people suffered because the government of Mexico wouldn't spend any money. More dramatically, they issued European debt. There's a whole lot of complexity around how they describe it, but the EU for the first time issued bonds to support member state budgets. This matters, right? Remember I said, if you compare the EU to a federation, it has one huge problem, which is that it does not redistribute between its member states. Well, now, just a little bit, it does. There's European Union guaranteed debt going to support the budgets of Italy or Spain or Romania. This could be the moment in retrospect at which the European Union starts to behave like a federation that supports its different member states and redistributes from the richer to the poorer. That would be extremely big deal. Whether it all continues, well, they're still fighting about it because this is large sums of money and large obligations, and you can imagine rich countries don't particularly want to do it. Now, maybe a lot of fourth face. So I was involved in writing the background preparation work for the European Union's global health strategy because one of the things they realized is that everything the EU does, because it is a rich 440 million person organization, 
that does a lot of aid, that has a large pharmaceutical industry and so forth. Everything it does influences the rest of the world. The pharmaceutical strategy will influence the Indian pharmaceuticals industry. The European health aid strategy will influence health system strengthening in Africa. The European Union gave a lot of money to COVAX, which was the WHO's vaccine acquisition project, because the WHO, the European Union, wants to strengthen the World Health Organization. The Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, they don't want to strengthen the World Health Organization. In general, everything the EU does turns out, because it's a big power, to influence the health of others. And they're starting to understand and think about that. So getting into the summary here. From the point of view of European integration, if what you like is European integration, and not a lot of people care about that, most people care about policy, but there's an expansion to the EU role, it does more. There's, of what it does, more of that is explicitly about health, and there's a lot more money and a lot more ambition in health. It's not changed everything, right? It still has no oversight of healthcare systems. It still provides little to no money to support healthcare systems. There's still very limited redistribution between richer and poorer states. And there's a whole lot of talk about patient centeredness and you know people engagement. It's still fundamentally about member states talking about their health systems. It's not about patients. Now, the risk is that member state and public trust will decline, that there's already kind of a bad reputation for European vaccine acquisition. I think it went about as well as you could have imagined. But when I say that to Europeans, they all cluck at me and say, no, it was terrible. Well, a lot of that is because the member states often screwed up. And when you screw up as a European politician, you blame Europe. It's a rule. Now, in about four years, they're going to rewrite their big seven year budget. So that's when we'll know if they want more European health policy, because in four years, we will all have forgotten COVID. I'll come back to that. And we will be have who knows what the next crisis is going to be. And the risk is that there won't be a coalition to support the maintenance and expansion of EU public health, right? So there's a hard deadline when they renegotiate the budget. So public health advocates have to do something good and have to make it known that they're doing something good over the next four years. Now, public health has what we call a panic neglect cycle. You panic, there's a pandemic, you buy masks in 2009, for example, with the flu pandemic. Then neglect, the pandemic passes, you start to say, oh, that was actually just a way to funnel money into drug companies or whatever, you know, it was all a big nothing. Um, you don't buy more masks, you don't keep up your stockpiles, it's 2019, the masks expire after 10 years. Certain countries have big bonfires where they incinerate all the masks. So in late 2019, the French didn't have any masks. And in early 2020, the French kind of wished they had masks. They started a new cycle of panic, right? So panic and neglect happen in every government. Just watch the enthusiasm with which governments in every corner of the world are taking down their COVID-19 social policies and their COVID-19 public health policies, their COVID-19 surveillance, right? We really want to go back to neglect. We're bored with panic. In the EU political environment, though, you make a decision at the beginning of a seven-year budget cycle. That means that the European Union can't quit caring until approximately 2028. That gives EU public health advocates a lot of time to establish themselves. And finally, don't underestimate the political impact of willful forgetfulness in the European Union and in everything. Think of all the people who don't want to remember COVID, the people who lost someone they love, the people who ran a small business. If you run a restaurant, COVID was nothing but pain. Okay, fine. I'd rather run a heavily subsidized restaurant with a furlough scheme in Europe than run a unsubsidized restaurant in South Africa. But either way, if what you do is run a restaurant or a bar, COVID was terrible for you. A lot of people had personally horrible experiences. You know, an extrovert living alone in an apartment in a big city didn't like COVID anywhere in the world. There was a wonderful case in China when they were still doing zero COVID of a guy who invited a date over on the second date because he was proud of his cooking and wanted to cook her a meal. During their date, they locked down his building and she had to spend two weeks with him. 
and at least that gave them a great opportunity to decide whether they were made to be a good couple, right? Can you imagine going to somebody's house for the second time and then having to spend two weeks basically in one room with them? Think of all the political parties that screwed up and don't want to talk about it anymore, right? Do the Republicans really want to be known as the party of horse paste going into 2024? Do the British conservatives want to talk about COVID-19 anymore? Do the Spanish socialists want to talk about COVID-19? Does the African National Congress want to talk about COVID-19? Does Modi want to talk about COVID-19? No. So you put all this together. There's a lot of people who hated it and don't want to think about it anymore. And the desire to forget, the desire to simply pretend that COVID never happened and that COVID isn't still happening, isn't still killing millions of people, is going to be a big driver of politics in the European Union and everywhere else. I think I have figured out why I don't seem to have a camera. So let me see if I'm right. Do you see me now? Yeah, finally we can see you. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, this is. Is my but uh, let's hope it works. Yeah, fine. Okay, so... give me one to fiddle with the camera. Uh, and then I will happily start answering questions. All right. So um, we can see you now and we can hear you very clearly. So I must thank you, Professor Scott. It was indeed a very engaging and yet a very simple presentation. You made it look so simple to us. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that's why the, we don't have too many questions. Probably the audience could understand whatever you were trying to put across to them. But before um, you know, going over to the question answer session, I would like to just brief about what you talked about today. Um, you started by providing us the detailed information on European Union, when and why it was formed, and how it is, uh, you know, deeply integrated, and the result of this integration, and various institutions in European Union. You discussed in detail, like European Council, Commission, and European Parliament. So that made us understand how it works. And finally, moving on to COVID-19 and its impact on the European Union, its health policies. Mm -hmm. uh, you also discussed how different member states are interdependent and how you know it is it, it helps them uh, be remaining collective. And also talking about the procurement of vaccines, how European Union handled during COVID the procurement to help the smaller countries. So that indeed was very interesting. So I would, uh, I think we have one question from Stefano for the time being. So uh, Professor Stefano, would you like to unmute yourself and ask or should I? Uh... Mm -hmm. Okay, Stefano has unmuted himself. So I think he would like to ask the question himself. Stefano, please go ahead. If you want to ask, ask, it's okay. You know, I'm a very... Uh... Okay. Uh, on, uh, online. They're both really good. <laughs> All right. Okay, fine. So, uh, Professor Scott, um, he has written that considering the EU global fourth phase and global governance of health, did COVID scratch the myth downscaling healthcare and public health as national affair or sovereignty? So, here's the problem there's this is goes back to my willful forgetfulness point is there's the conclusion that i would draw and i think covid taught us a lot about politics and then there's the conclusion that policymakers draw and a lot of policymakers as i said screwed up made big mistakes know they made big mistakes and want to pretend it never happened right um, I'm not going to tell the assembled gathering what Indian politics are like because it's far too complicated for my simple mind. But look at South Africa. South Africa shut everybody in their houses. South Africa is not a rich country. South Africa is a country where a lot of people live in very small housing. Closing everybody up meant that a lot of people who lived day to day suddenly had no food and no income. It did slow the spread for a month, but then when they reopened, everybody, you know, all these people who had been working in mines had to walk home. I'm sure this is a story we saw in many countries in the world. The result was that a lot of people were miserable for about two weeks and they still got a big pandemic with no good health system to so help, help their problems. Do you think the South African government 
wants to talk about that experience with anybody? Do you think they want to remind us that it happened? And so you see a lot of that intentional creation, right? Both American political parties want to say that COVID-19 is over. You know, Joe Biden wants to say that he finished it because it's a downer, it's depressing. And Donald Trump, of course, is Donald Trump. Um, again, go over to Brazil. Jair Bolsonaro was a COVID denialist, so he was consistent that COVID wasn't a problem. But his successor doesn't want to be the COVID president. His successor wants to have a new foundation. So country after country, you see political leaders who want to reassert the way it was in 2019. Again, the European Union is a little bit of an exception. It has developed a bit more of a global consciousness, but I was involved in doing background research for the European Commission to try and influence its global health strategy. And yes, it's dramatic, it's, it's a big deal. The European Union puts a lot of money into development aid. The European Union has a lot of effect on health, but for example, we said, and I was in, doing the work through the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, most of the world's main concept of European Union health policy is protection for the pharmaceutical industry. And you have to integrate trade policy because that is where the rubber hits the road. That is the most important element of European health policy from the point of view of India or Brazil or Mozambique. In other words, from the point of view of most of the world. And we said integrate trade policy. And within the European Commission, the trade directorate general said, hell no, we want nothing to do with it. We do not wish to subordinate our goals to health. And member state industry and trade ministers said, no, our job is to get rich by selling stuff to the world. Our job is not to lose money by contributing to global health. You know, if we're going to contribute to vaccination in Africa, we're going to do it as part of the foreign aid budget not by rethinking the way the pharmaceutical industry works. So yes, the European Union took a big step forward. There is a global health strategy now, and it does integrate health and development, but you can still see the extent to which pre-existing interests are just delighted to reassert themselves and stop paying attention to the global dimension and the health dimension of what they do. Uh, thank you, Shweta, by the way. I appreciate that. Now, you, uh, yeah, please continue. Yes, please continue. Is there is another question? Because otherwise I'll go answer Stefano's other question. Uh, okay, you may complete that first. Okay, so remember I said there's a panic and neglect cycle. And I referred to something called HERA, which is a new agency. Basically, all the key decisions about European Union COVID-19 response were made by the European Council, the heads of government, in June 2020. They spent three days packed together in Brussels. Amazingly, they didn't all give each other COVID. And they outlined everything important. And all the legislation and the budget work since then has been implementing what the heads of government said to do. Remember, I said huge political power. When the European Council decides to do something, everybody else basically makes it happen. So that was the moment, right? That was the window of opportunity. The window of opportunity was closed by July 2020. We're implementing what they did in June. But the first thing I would do as health commissioner is I would identify the spots where we're still negotiating. And HERA, the Health Emergency Response and Preparedness Agency, is one where there's still an opportunity to do something dramatic, invest in real innovative health preparedness. And likewise, the global health strategy could be made more dramatic as by, for example, trying to integrate trade into sustainable development, which is Sorry, integrate health into sustainable development, which is a goal of EU trade policy. Sorry, even I get this confused. And the other thing I would do is I would focus on building the coalition because eyes on the price in any political system, you look at the next decision point and the next decision point for money in the European Union is 2027 when they agree the budget for 2028 through 2035. You have your job or my job, if I'm the new health commissioner, is to make sure that there's a powerful coalition of people who know what I'm doing and appreciate it and who will fight for me when everybody else wants to cut the health budget and put it into whatever the new crisis is. So I would be an unglamorous health commissioner. I would 
fight about the nature of the health emergency response and preparedness agency and I would fight to explain the global health brief and otherwise what I would do is I would really really make sure that we didn't spend a minute or a euro that wasn't building the coalition that valued European public health action because politics either happens very quickly or very slowly and it's already getting a little bit late to make sure that there's a coalition for European public health in place by 2026 and 2027. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Scott. Uh, I don't think we have any other question. And uh, Dr. Shweta has put in a comment thanking you for the wonderful presentation. She's from Fortis Hospital, Mohali. And uh, I think before we end the session, I would like to invite Professor Monica. We have the privilege to ha uh, uh, having, uh, having her today. So please, over to you, Professor Monica. <laughs> you, Professor you Monica. Take, you take me by oh. But thank you very much, Scott. It was wonderful to see you, to hear you, and learn from you. It was really very, very instructive what you told us. Now, what I would say is uh, I, I studied AIDS very much when it happened. And um, if I look backwards, I think a lot of sustainable things came out of it, although there were not many uh, explicit policies behind. I mean, all the things people were fighting for during the AIDS epidemic to uh, make victims or people who are at risk participate in the policy making. That was all the participation of uh, gay organizations, uh, patients' rights, control the quality of medicine because we had this uh, contaminated blood problem, and, and many examples. And it became all sustainable. There's no policy anymore behind it. It's sort of stable, it's developing, it's going forward. And I think the same could happen with. Uh, preventing uh, pandemics now that we have seen what a pandemic can do you know it can throw the whole economy down and that means social security systems will run out of money and 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 maybe even wars could come out of it so we have seen that in the long time past so i would not be so um, pessimistic as you seemed saying that everything sort of slowed down the window was closing there's a lot of money who went into it from the European Union, and it's for several years. So I think it will it will produce sustainable sustainable effects somewhere. Don't you think so? I, I do, but I, I in part of like what I'm do I'm used to doing is yelling at Europeans, saying, "You have three years uh, to yeah, show that's right. the benefit. Mm -hmm. You have three years to do it, mm -hmm. and make sure that people see what you did, and decide that they want to fight for more of it." That's right, and. So a lot of organizations and people in the world who don't get much done in three years. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so this is partly right now I'm yelling at them. I think there is a lot of good stuff going on, but equally, you know, we don't know who's going to be running European member states in 2026 and 2027 when they do the negotiating. Yeah. And there's a lot of political parties in Europe that have learned that they don't like public health. They don't like public health. No, because they're all the pujadist. They're all the uh, petty bourgeois. Mm -hmm. I run a bar. I run a small business. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want you to close my restaurant. Mm -hmm. And those parties had a lot of trouble early in the pandemic. They didn't know what to say. And they tried to blame foreigners, and that didn't work. And they tried to blame China, and that didn't work especially well. But gradually, what they converged on is that they don't like vaccinations, and they don't like masks, and they don't like public health law. You know, the Brothers of Italy um, was, was a great case, and she's running Italy now. Mm -hmm. So there's a very clear enemy of public health, because globally, the populist radical right, be it, you know, the Brothers of Italy in Italy, or mm -hmm. Bolsonaro in Brazil, or the Republicans in the United States, they converged on a don't tell me what to do. Get these mm -hmm. stupid public health mm -hmm. elites out of my bar. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And that's the enemy. Fortunately, that those parties are the enemy of a lot of other powerful people too. Maybe one of the reasons for the difference between AIDS and, and, and COVID in the long-term effects, uh, well, the long-term effects for COVID we haven't seen yet, but what, what we can imagine, uh, 
according to what you say, uh, it may slow down, is in, in AIDS, it was young people who died. And some of them had uh, positions where they could speak up very strongly, artists and journalists, that was the beginning. Afterwards, it was poor drug abusers, but they gave the drive. And in the uh, COVID epidemic, well, it's old people who die. Well, there may be politicians quite happy about that because they economize the retirement <laughs> uh, payments. So it's, it's, they are not organized. They don't have the power to fight. So there's maybe something lacking in the civil society support, and then it will not reach politics. I, yeah, the, the, the extent to which, and you even see it today, right? Like when you look at the shameful lack of vaccination in Africa, part of the problem is that a huge proportion of everyone in Africa is under five. Yeah. Right? Kids <laughs> under five aren't vaccinated in most places. Kids under five are like a third of the population in Niger. Yeah. So but that's... I think that the way to approach it, I mean, a lot of people suffered from COVID, but they don't know whether they COVID was the problem or the lockdowns, right? So if I yeah. run a bar, I might say a two week flu was a much less bad experience than having my bar destroyed by regulations on public health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. What interests me is long COVID. Because long COVID affects disproportionately one group of people, medical professionals, highly educated, powerful people. Mm -hmm. So if you want an analog to the gay rights movement within AIDS, I would say, especially in a couple of countries like the United Kingdom, there's a lot of very organized and angry doctors and nurses who basically acquired what might be a lifetime impairment disability from doing their jobs. And they're still educated and angry and powerful and wealthy and articulate. So it would mean it takes some time because this effect has to, to come out. It's a long COVID. The, well, they, they, they get this because they're affected several times. Now, you can get it each time. If you get COVID three times, you have three shots at getting it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. What it means is that you have potentially the core of a social movement that cares about COVID. Mm -hmm. And it's a social movement that begins in about the best possible place, which is rich and powerful professionals. Mm -hmm. That's right. And a lot of them got it in 2020. So they've had three years to get mad. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's interesting to make a parallel between these professions and uh, those gay organizations. Maybe it will come from there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, but I think also the European Union um, experienced you know, some very hard time, and I don't think they want to have that again. So they, they probably be more serious about the investment and the policies they made in place. <laughs> I'm an optimist. <laughs> well, I was... I mean, it was weird for me because even in our 2019 book, we were very critical of the European Union's priorities. And mm -hmm. then in 2022, we had to write a totally different book about how they're suddenly doing everything we like. I like very much, you have to explain this, your concept, failing forward. Oh, that was really good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful. It was not falling forward, as I understood when yeah. I read the first time, second time. <laughs> Failing forward. This, I continue <laughs> to, not, to the no. Indian to the Indian professionals. I think they will like it. Okay, so failing forward is a neat concept. It's not mine, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. it was developed yeah, by saw... people studying the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. But basically, you have two facts about, and then I see a couple of great questions coming up here. You have two facts about the European Union, right? First of all, integration keeps happening. Right. So every time you have a crisis, mm -hmm. and the Daily Telegraph says the European Union will fall apart now. Instead, it unifies more. You have a financial crisis. It gets a unified financial framework. Mm -hmm. you have a refugee crisis. It gets a unified refugee policy. You have mm -hmm. a health crisis. You get a unified health policy. Russia invades Ukraine. You suddenly get the European Union spending its own money on weapons. Mm -hmm. You have 10,000 paramilitary European almost soldiers in Moldova under Frontex, mm -hmm. right? This looks more and more like a state. This mm -hmm. looks like 
mm-hmm. right? It's posting soldiers abroad. It's buying weapons. It has a health, a public health policy of its own. It has a fiscal policy of its own. This looks like something. But at the same time, whenever you talk to any policy analyst about any of these areas, they say it's a disaster, it's terrible, it's disorganized, the member states have blocked all the effective stuff. How do you reconcile this paradox? That's the concept of failing forward. Failing forward is that the European Union encounters a problem because of its integration, right? So it has free travel within the European Union. That means external borders are really important. So what happens when a whole lot of refugees show up at the border? Right? You can't just say it's Greece's problem. Mm -hmm. The incentive is for Greece to just let everybody in and then they, can, then they can go be Germany's problem, right? Which nobody likes, including the refugees. So then you say, what is the minimum thing we can do to solve this problem, right? We have a fiscal crisis because we have a shared currency. What is the minimum thing we can do to share out, solve this fiscal crisis? We have a mm -hmm. Russian invasion of Ukraine. What is the minimal thing we can do to support Ukraine while maintaining our national autonomy? So they fail forward. They move forward. Mm -hmm. They integrate more than they were before the crisis. But they also, it comes from failure of the previous framework and it creates <coughs> failure of the next framework. So they build all these fiscal frameworks and the one consistent thing is they don't work. Because ultimately, if you go to an elected government and you say, you have the choice of obeying the European Union and losing office, or disobeying the European Union and getting reelected, they'll choose getting reelected, right? I'd rather be reelected and in the Council of Ministers than appreciated by the European Commission and out of a job. Mm -hmm. So they do the minimum to solve their common problem and thereby create the next crisis. Mm -hmm. We are right now watching the failure of their solutions to the 2010 debt crisis as interest rates go up and we learn something I've been saying for a decade, which is they have solved none of the problems of the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. And they'll fail forward again. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I think uh, Professor Scott, we have a couple of more questions before we end the session very, very quickly. Uh, one is from uh, Ms. Preeti, who wants to connect with you on LinkedIn first. And uh, I hope you are on LinkedIn, so she would like to connect with you. Now that I've left Twitter, I suppose I need to pay more attention to LinkedIn. So uh, okay. be patient with my slow response because I'm still in Twitter withdrawal. Um, All right. So once we are on LinkedIn now, she would like to connect with you. And she has put in a very small question that, you know, like you quoted that policymakers will be making health policies for several years to come. So what do you think is their key focus area should be? Okay. Bearing in mind that um, my honest expertise gets very thin once we leave the OECD, I think the thing that nobody is paying enough attention to is workforce, any dimension of workforce. Because starting at the bottom of the income ladder, the caring workforce, the unpaid people caring for family members, most countries in the world are on a trajectory to demographic shrinkage, right? China is now shrinking. You know, if you just draw a line, there won't be any Italians in 100 years. I'm confident there will be Italians, but not on the current birth rate. So unpaid care, family members looking after family members, that's a crisis. Paid care, pretty much around the world, being a paid worker helping older or disabled people is a terrible job. We make it a terrible job. We exploit people's good intentions. Health professions that aren't doctors and nurses, again, they tend to have professional qualifications that you can't move. You have to train them in country. You want them to replace doctors and nurses who are even scarcer, but we often don't have the capacity and don't pay them well enough. Nurses. The whole world cannot depend on Indian nurses, sorry, on Filipino nurses, just like the whole world cannot depend on Indian doctors. Doctors and nurses on the international market tend to come from countries which have expanded their education but haven't expanded good jobs in their health systems. Well, the problem is this means that 
the whole world is dependent on the Indian health system not paying very well. That's not necessarily stable. So instead of buy, you should make, right? At the moment, you have these enormous migratory flows, Philippines to United States, India to the United States, Nigeria to Britain. Well, whether that's good for Nigeria or India or Britain or the United States is one question. Whether it's sustainable, the answer is almost certainly no. And anybody who thinks about health, work, health workforce has been saying there's a big crisis coming because there's a lot of older doctors and nurses who are retiring. And they were going to retire anyway, but they hung around. In 2019, we were all waiting for the big retirement wave, and especially the rich countries. Well, guess what? It turned out they all really retired, and a bunch of them took early retirement, and a bunch of them have long COVID, and they're disabled. 20% of the health workforce, total health workforce of Austria, is on sick leave. Another 20% have resigned. Half the people, almost half of the people working in healthcare in Austria in 2019 have left. This is going to start producing bad health effects. This is also going to make it really, really hard to sustainably operate any health system. So I'd say that worldwide, we haven't invested in health systems and health workforce. We've talked a lot of garbage. And the result is that we have pretty much every country has some form of domestic crisis. You have a couple of countries where you're producing more people than you can employ, and a lot of countries where you're producing fewer people than you need. And we need to have a very serious set of conversations around the world. Are we going to try to patch this all with migration? Who gets a say in that thinking? And what do you do, not just about doctors and nurses and specialist doctors, but also about all these jobs like phlebotomists, the people who draw blood? You know, how are you training them? It's not like you do that for fun, right? So I would say that the really big crisis within the health sector worldwide is workforce. I would also say that if the big global crisis is climate change, healthcare takes up between 5 and 15 percent uh, sorry, is between 5 and 15 percent of the total emissions of most middle and upper income countries. So we should be thinking very hard about our own contribution to environmental disaster. So I think those would be the, the priorities. Okay, Professor Scott, uh, so you made us realize the healthcare yeah. uh, workforce crisis we are going to face or are already into it. Uh, Can I so we... The big cohort studies of long COVID are in Britain and the United States because those are the countries that pay for biomedical research on that level, especially Britain. Britain has the best data and they put the money in. Would I love to know what long COVID looks like in Mexico or South Africa or even Spain? I would. Do I expect that kind of serious research out of those countries? Unfortunately, I don't. Mm -hmm. But watch the British in particular. Those are good studies. Okay. All right. So we have another question from uh, Mr. Hirat Deep Singh, who says that uh, taking up the research on long-term effects of COVID as a cohort study would not be a bad idea in countries where financial resources are not a problem. So would you like to throw some light on it uh, as if, you know, what EU is actually doing in this direction? Okay, so that was the one I was trying to answer in very yeah. abbreviated form because I thought you were telling me that the class was about to end. <laughs> we have yeah, just we need one, more question. one more question after this and then we will end. Okay, I great. Well, we here, time. Here. I hope you have the time. We are not delaying you. No, I'm fine. All right. Um, yeah, I have, I have more time blocked in, but sorry, I, I misunderstood. Cohort studies and long COVID. Here's the problem. There is always some kind of a weird disease, and it changes its name. But like in every society, you can find this disease, and it involves fatigue and aches and pains, and maybe your brain fo is foggy or not as smart as you used to be. And this disease has many names, right? Hysteria, neurasthenia, chronic fatigue syndrome, long COVID. And most of the time, what happens is very gendered, and I'm mostly speaking to Western countries. I don't know the data from other countries. 
it's very gendered. It's viewed as a woman's thing, right? Some weird unattributable syndrome that you can't diagnose. There's no biomarkers. You can't find it with blood, dra blood draws. And it gets gendered and it gets ignored. And you end up with this very characteristic problem of a lot of men who probably have it but are denying the problem. And a lot of women who have it and are extremely frustrated with the healthcare system. And a healthcare system which says you're imagining it, you should eat better food and exercise more and your problem will go away. And if your problem is fatigue and muscle aches, then exercise more is pretty poor advice, right? This happens all the time, right? Throughout medical history, I, you know, and when I read comparative medical history, you find the same thing, right? A lot of Chinese medicine is about trying to solve this problem. Everybody gets it. And in most cases, it's gendered. It's like the weird woman thing. Well, long COVID has these characteristics, right? What are the salient effects of long COVID? Um, it's highly variable, of course, but it's also, it's muscle aches, it's fatigue, it's brain fog. It's like random heart palpitations where your heart suddenly speeds up for no reason. But there's a difference. When we called it neurasthenia or chronic fatigue syndrome, nobody knew where it came from and nobody had a clear diagnosis. With long COVID, you have a diagnosis. You have people who say, I was fine on March 5th and by March 25th, I had had severe COVID and then I had long COVID and the symptoms began. So taking this thing that happens all the time across history, the, the, the thing that makes you feel bad with no clinical indicator, and making it into long COVID changes its politics. It makes it into a social movement that matters. And also these cohort studies, I think, are going to shed some light on this broader problem, that there's a lot of things out there that make people feel like garbage. And it's not enough to say we did a blood draw, we didn't find anything, so you should start jogging. Anyway, who's actually doing the research? There are some US cohort studies. They're flawed by the fact that the United States due to the privatization of our system has trouble enrolling people except through individual healthcare systems and there's big problems with that. The best studies are in Britain. There are some smaller cohort studies in a couple of other EU member states. Most of the world just is not set up to do that. They don't have the money, they don't have the research priority, they don't have the data. So. Even if Spain, for example, would be a great country to run it and they have the data, they just don't spend the money on biomedical research. They just don't. They should do a cohort study. They don't. The French should do cohort studies. They don't do big ones. So we all need to watch the British. And if you think your country in any way, shape or form is different from the United Kingdom, uh, tough. Okay. So Britain is to be looked up to. Okay, fine. As far as research is <laughs> watch, concerned. Watch what they learned from it. Don't look up to them right now, right? That country is a clown show, but they still know how to do a cohort study. Right. Okay, right. Uh, so my final question for the day would be from Mr. Abhishek, who wants to know whether, you know, uh, what strategy did EU adopt to decrease vaccine hesitancies? I think you described a little bit in your presentation also, and if identified anyone in the pandemic times. So you, you, you had mentioned, you know, how uh, collective procurement of vaccination vaccines was done and anything further to decrease the vaccine hesitancies because many people were not willing to go in for vaccination. So what was it that EU tried to make them convinced uh, yeah. to go in for vaccination? So my first answer is we're doing another big international project, right? So we did one big global book about 2020 and you know public health measures and we're now preparing a second one about vaccine vaccinations i think the thing to bear in mind in the specific so, so a lot of the answer is i don't know talk to me in six months but the specific thing to do is in thinking about the issue is to divide between vaccines and vaccinations right a vaccine is a little vial full of something that regulators have deemed safe and, safe and effective. A vaccination is somebody who has received that vaccination, right? It's, it's a needle in an arm. And these are very different problems, right? So what the European Union has done 
is vaccines, right? And that's a whole set of complicated issues. How do you pay for research? How do you advance purchased vaccines? How do you decide about liability? How do you decide which vaccines are likely to work? What do the regulators do? Who buys them? How do you get in the queue? How do you make sure that lower income countries get access to vaccines? How do you negotiate the supply chain to make sure that the ingredients for vaccines arrive at the factory at the right time? That's all about producing the vaccines. And at the end of it, what you have is a pallet of super cooled boxes containing a Pfizer vaccine or a pallet of less super cooled vaccines with, you know, Sinovac or Novavax or the others. Once that airplane arrives with that pallet, you have a whole set of different questions, which is how do you get it out to the clinics? How do you train the workforce to administer it and not spoil it? How do you allocate a scarce resource to people? How do you avoid the doctors just giving it to themselves and their family instead of their needy patients? How do you overcome vaccine hesitancy? How do you persuade people to prioritize it when they think other diseases are a bigger problem? How do you deal with political movements that are opposed to vaccination? So there are two different problems, right? The EU was a vaccine side. It negotiated advanced purchase contracts. It regulated quality, safety, and effectiveness. And at the end of it, airplanes landed in European capitals and airports with pallets of vaccine. At which point the problem became vaccination. Who gets it? What's the communication? How do you deal with anti-vaccination movements? What kinds of compulsion do you use? What kinds of education? How many doses do you give to people? Do you give them to children? Do you make them mandatory? What do you do with religious minorities who don't like them? All these questions. The European Union per se has taught us almost nothing about vaccination. We've learned a lot about how to acquire vaccines and about the costs and benefits of the current way we finance and vaccines in the world. What is the EU taught us about vaccinations? Not much, because the EU role ended when it set the price and quantity, and after that, France would write the check, and the pharmaceutical company would deliver the vaccine vials to France, and then it was the French problem to get them into people. So... This gets confused because I said it was a rule and I meant it. So whenever anything goes wrong and something's always going wrong, right? This is democratic politics. Even if nothing's going wrong, the opposition parties in the media will find something going wrong. And the governments would blame the European Union, right? So if the Dutch, for example, went way too slowly and nobody liked the prioritization scheme and the Dutch government blamed Europe. And the French were coercive, and when people objected to that, they blamed Europe. So a lot of Europeans think the EU screwed up because member state governments blamed Europe. In reality, vaccination failures are not something the European Union could affect. So we didn't learn anything about vaccination, but if you go down to the level of why did the Dutch screw up or why do you have such incredibly high vaccine resistance in uh, post-communist countries, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, Romania, and Bulgaria. That strip of countries, any country occupied by Russia, just does not take their vaccines. We learned that in the context of the European Union where we wasted a lot of vaccines that were sent to Croatia or Bulgaria or Ukraine, but all that did is the European Union set up a problem where the answer is fundamentally going to lie in the politics and culture of Poland or Croatia or what have you. This must feel like the World Cup with me listing all these different countries you don't usually think about. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for finding time to be with us and making such an interesting presentation and then staying back to answer all our queries. Thank you very much once again. So uh, it's over to Professor Stefano to say the last word and thank you uh, from his side. So Professor uh, Stefano, it's over to you. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, it was really excellent. So and I can really imagine for you as an American for the first three, four years to understand this madhouse called European Union. 
it has to be some kind of actually mystic travel to understand the output of uh, 50 years and more of compromises that has come up with this very strange uh, uh, machine. So thank you really so much. I have to endorse your position and I don't call it as, as actually negative but I call it or what we are actually seeing. I just invite all of us thinking about one year and a half ago, everyone was saying COVID, COVID has changed the world. We will never be, the world gonna be a better place. And now we are actually speaking about uh, actually war. And we are thinking if a third, actually, World War could happen. And probably it's also that's why we are actually doing this kind of uh, actually project and uh, activity, just to try to uh, spread the uh, voice that health is a global affair. Uh, this is the no, actually message because uh, uh, COVID, uh, we need to ask to ourselves why COVID has happened, why NIPA has happened, and uh, what actually gonna happen next, and what we can do is to ask our policy makers to don't think about the next week, but uh, at least to think about the next five years. Ideally, they should think about the next 30 years, 50 years. So what is what we can actually do in our tiny uh, garden is just to ask our policy makers to try to look a bit forward, to don't think about the next election or to the day after newspaper, but to really take the huge uh, responsibility that they actually have uh, being in that actually position is a very complex position, but they must think about the next five, 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you. Quickly say one thing. I don't think you might appreciate it from living in India, but most of the world does not recognize just how big a disaster COVID was. If you go look at the UN Sustainable Development Goal report, it was a disaster for poverty. It was a disaster for women. It was a disaster for inequality. It was a disaster for income inequality. We have gone backwards on about half of the social development of uh, sustainable development goals. In particular, everything to do with equality and poverty. So I fully agree and what I do hope is we get some recognition of just how far backward we've gone. We've wiped out 15 years worth of improvement worldwide. We're functionally in about 2005. What I really hope that the people will not uh, forget, and mainly that the actually voters will not actually forget. So when the people are gonna go to actually vote, they gonna ask to their politician what they are actually thinking about healthcare, global health, and environment. Because all, actually Dixty, all these two, three actually dimensions are very closely correlated. Thank you so much again. And I hope to actually see you soon again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Bye, Monica. It was great to see you.